Viana Checks. Uh, I'm Chase, this is Kyla, Fisher, and Malin. We've been attending Glory Day for about five years now. Yeah, and we've, we've... We are the Yanacheks. Uh, I'm Chase, this is Kyla, Fisher, and Malin. We've been attending Glory Day for about five years now. Yeah, and we've, we've loved it.
Good morning, Gloria Day. How many of us are ready to worship King Jesus this morning? Amen. Would you stand up and join us? Father God, this morning we just thank you for another day of life. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to walk into this place as the body of Christ. To simply come and honor and glorify and exalt your name. We ask you to receive this worship in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church says, Amen. Come on church, put those hands together. We came to give God praise this morning. Amen. Is anybody here this morning that came to give God praise? I want to invite you to just lift up your voice, lift up your heart this morning, and give God your very best worship. How praise in the valley, praise on a mountain. I'll praise when I'm so, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded Cause praise is the water My enemies drowning Come on, lift your voice and declare this morning As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to pray
invite you to just lift your voice and sing with us like this. And this is my story. I testify that God is good all the time. He saw me. Randy Miller, I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to welcome all of you here and as we continue our worship to receive our tithes and our offerings. Uh, one thing that we want to celebrate is the addition of new members to our church family. Recently, we had two new member classes. One was midweek. For the first time, we offered this because we heard that people had Sunday morning commitments and couldn't attend all the classes. So we tried this midweek uh, class and it went really well and we also just completed a Sunday morning class. So the pictures that you see in front of you uh, are the participants of those classes. Uh, some of them are church staff, others are on day one staff, others you might see up on the platform here who said yes, we'll commit to membership. Uh, so it's wonderful to see, to see their gifts and their talents as we take their next steps with them uh, to be able to use uh, their gifts so that they might fulfill God's calling in their life to make an impact, not just here at Glory Day with all of us, but more importantly, out in our community as they follow God's calling in their life. So as we receive our tithes and offerings, I would encourage you to scan the QR code in the pew ahead of you. There's a communion statement that we would encourage you to read as a way to prepare for Holy Communion later on in the service. Ushers.
the grace of the Father, we give you thanks that because of your indescribable gift, you have said we are made for more. You call it abundant life. The thief comes to steal, kill, rob, and destroy, but you came that we might have life to the fullest, made for more. So, Lord, we give you thanks for that opportunity. So, Lord, as we study your word, as we look what it means that we are made for more, Lord, it almost feels like we're meddling a little bit when we talk about finances. The Lord, we are made for more to put you first in our lives, in our, in our finances, in our interests, in our relationships, in our schedule, in our, in our time. And so we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear this word from you today. Empty me of me, fill me with your spirit. Give me the words you want me to say and bless us as we live in a measure more ways than we ever ask or imagine in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good morning. I'm Dan Shepard, one of the pastors here, and uh, it is a blessing to be here with you this morning. Three weeks ago, we began this sermon series, and I share with you a bold vision that we're beginning a strategic initiative and starting a capital campaign to raise five and a half million over the next three and a half years. I began that series by looking at Paul's letter to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. And not only the campaign called immeasurably more, but we looked at what it means to live immeasurably more lives. Because in that prayer to the Ephesian congregation, it's been my prayer for Gloria Day. That through this capital campaign and throughout all the ministry here at Gloria Day, helping more people live life with Jesus every day means that we would know the height, the depth, the breadth of God's love, that that love that surpasses all understanding, that we be filled with the fullness of God. This is probably the only time it's a compliment to say you're full of it. If we could walk around filled with Jesus, I would love to say you're full of it and that people would see Jesus in you in immeasurably more ways than we could ever ask or imagine. And so this morning, as we continue this series, I want to take a look at an Old Testament story that something has never happened in 28 years of ministry here at Gloria Day for me, or here, here in my ministry, or here at Gloria Day. And so I'd love for you to turn to Exodus chapter 19. If you're using the Bible in front of you, it's the second book of the Bible. It's on page, let's see. Page 75. And when you get to page 75, Exodus chapter 35, I want you to go back to 19. So we're going to go through chapters 19 to 35. I promise you'll be out of here by 6 p.m. tonight. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now I want to set the stage up because we're going to be looking at Exodus 35 and 36, but the story actually begins in Exodus 19. You see, Exodus 19 it's about three months after God's people had been liberated from Egyptian captivity. Remember the whole thing, the ten plagues, uh, angel of death, Red Sea, part of the Red Sea, they go through, Pharaoh's army is destroyed. They're three months into the wilderness. And God directs them to go to the base of Mount Sinai. And he gives Moses these words to share with the people. He said, you, Israel, are a special nation. You are a treasured possession among all peoples if you obey my commands. What were those commands? Well, Exodus 20. God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. In chapters 21, 22, and 23, see, I told you we go through quick. He gives more instructions about, about concerning those Ten Commandments, how they live out special dietary rules and the Sabbath and different laws. I'm glad I'm not Old Testament people because there's a lot of them there. And so God gives the Ten Commandments, the nation of Israel, how to live according to those Ten Commandments. And in 20, chapter 24, after speaking with Moses, God says, hey, Go down to back to the people, bring Aaron back up with you, but tell the people the commands of the law. He doesn't take anything with them yet. And the people say, yep, we're going to do it. So Moses reports back, here's what you guys got to do, that we got it. In the morning, 
They build an altar at the foot of Mount Sinai. The people of Israel worship God. Moses goes back to the top of Mount Sinai to receive further instructions from the Lord, and he would be on the mountaintop for 40 days. And then you look at Exodus 25, 26, and 27. God gives Moses all the different commands about the tabernacle, how specifically Moses is to build this tabernacle. He commands him, build this tabernacle, that is where my glory will dwell. And that Moses, Moses instruct the people that they were to give freely, willingly, and voluntarily for the completion of that tabernacle. And God, I mean, very specific pattern how the tabernacle was to be built and the size of all the different furnishings within that tabernacle. And then in 28, God gives instruction to Moses about the priesthood, about the priests, what they're supposed to wear, the sacrifices they're supposed to have, the festivals they are to endure and participate and celebrate. Exodus, that's 28, 29, and 30. In 31, God gives Moses two guys. He said, I'm going to provide you with two guys. This is two guys who are very gifted, very skilled men to build items for the tabernacle. And then God etches the Ten Commandments into the two tablets of stone. All right? So that's all the way to 31. And then in 32, meanwhile, all this conversation, God and Moses has been going on these 40 days. The people at the base of Mount Sinai became impatient. I mean, 40 days is a long time, I guess. And so they built, I mean, they built a golden calf. They made an altar to the golden calf. Moses comes down to the mountain and he sees the people worshiping the calf, bowing down to it, singing praise, dancing around it. He hears all this uproar and he can't figure out what's going on. He sees what's going on. He is ticked. I mean, this is not a, this guy's upset, all right? And he throws down the two tablets of stone, breaks those two tablets, the fingerprint of God, and then he destroys the golden calf. Don't mess with Moses, y'all. He grounds it up into powder, and then he pours it into the water, and he says, you drink your God. And he makes them drink the powder of the golden calf. And then 3,000 of the wicked are killed. I mean, just don't mess around. Okay? God is upset. God, well, God's pretty angry. I mean, I don't know how you else you'd say it. Moses knows it, so Moses goes back up the mountain, and he intercedes, he pleads with God. He says, God, I know you're going to leave these people. I know you want to destroy them. Don't. God grants Moses' request. And in Exodus 34, you see that Moses receives a new two tablets of stone. Moses is on the mountaintop for another 40 days. But this time as he comes down, his face is glowing. And be, meanwhile, I forgot to tell you earlier in Tech 32, as Moses went out to plead for the people of Israel, God sent a plague to punish all of Israel. So they're dealing with this plague. They've had the golden calf destroyed. They had to drink the powder, water, gold, whatever it is. And then Moses comes down, the people had repented. God forgave them their sin. Moses comes down, his face is glowing, it has to be veiled. But when he speaks the word of God, they remove the veil so they can see it's God speaking. And what was the word? If you look at verse 35, chapter 35. Verse 1. I didn't tell a slide, guys, so you don't see it up there. Verse 1, Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. And he goes through all that whole list of litany things. Then we pick it up on verse 4. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Okay, remember what he said? I want you to build a tabernacle. I want you to build a dwelling place 
where I will, my glory, my presence will dwell within. God would be among his people. It was a visual sign. You would see as the tabernacle would travel, you see this, the presence of God within the Holy of Holies. And people knew that, that God was with his people Israel. What did Moses do in, in verse 4 of chapter 35? He started the capital campaign. I cannot think of the worst time to start a capital campaign. Think about this. The people 40 days earlier had rebelled against God. They made a golden calf. Moses grounds it up in a powder, throws it in the water, makes them drink it. 3,000 people are killed, and a plague is going across everybody's land. Oh, by the way, guys, guess what? I want you to start forking over the cash for a building of my, sense, my tabernacle. What a great time for a capital campaign. I can't think of a worse time for a capital campaign. Three weeks ago, I shared that Gloria Day was embarking upon a capital campaign. I've heard like, are you kidding me? Why now? Why are we doing this? How come it's all about? This is like the worst time to do a capital campaign. The election's coming up, economy's, I mean, blah, 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 man. I said, I got, I got a good reference right here. We haven't had a golden calf. I haven't ground the powder yet. We're not drinking the water. So I think we're good right now, guys. But here's what I've been thinking about, and here's what I've been praying about for this capital campaign. That it's not a fundraiser, it's a faith raiser. That sounds like cliche but I'm telling you, I, I love the comments that I've heard from folks who have gone through this capital campaign with me through the last three weeks, three months. They said to me, I've never been a part of a congregation that focused so much on biblical teaching and raising up God's word about generosity versus saying just fork over the cash. Because if we said this campaign is about raising people, this is what my prayer has been in Ephesians chapter 3, that God would use this capital campaign to raise his people that would be filled with the fullness of God, that we can't help but respond with the generosity of God. And so for the last two weeks, Pastor Randy and our guest speaker, Alex Judd, shared with us how God can do immeasurably more in our lives as we live as his children, redeemed, forgiven, obedient. Pastor Randy discussed two weeks ago how five loaves and two fish in the hands of an almighty God can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, the disciples could ever ask or imagine. A simple gift from a child. Alex shared with us last week that God showed up in immeasurably more ways in the early church as they lived with devotion, with a sense of awe, and with generosity. That they served one another. They took care of each other's needs. They lived life together. And the result was that there's many signs and wonders that was done through the apostles. And the Lord showed up in immeasurably more ways adding to their number daily those who were being saved. And so as we talk about this immeasurably more theme, I want you to see how God showed up in this situation, in this capital campaign, through the response of God's people. Again, remember what just took place. The people of God had witnessed and experienced God's wrath and judgment. Moses intercedes. God relents, and he brings the people back in this covenantal relationship with himself. The children of Israel sinned greatly and gravely in making a golden calf. Their, their idolatry was this bold, loud statement. God, we don't trust you. We don't think you're a big enough God for us. Therefore, we're going to make our own. But now... Experiencing the grace of God, their response was, we trust you. You see, God had forgiven them, and he would use the people of Israel for his glory. And all he asked them was to walk in his ways, to be obedient, and to trust him with their lives, with their possessions, with their stuff. And so response to God's grace in chapter 35, in response to God's mercy, in response to his provision, the Israelites demonstrate that trust of the Lord and show up 
in a measure more ways. So in verse 4, Moses reminded the people, this is what God has commanded us to do. And this is where God's glory will be dwelling among them. This is the thing the Lord has commanded. But in order to follow through with that command, there's going to be a substantial amount of supplies and materials that are needed. So look at the next verses. In verse 5, he lists gold, silver, and brown, bronze. Verse 6, special yarns and linens. Verse 7, tanned skins and special acacia wood. There's oil needed for light, for anointing, for incense. Verse 9, bring the onyx stones and other special rare gemstones. And then every skilled craftsman is to come together to make all the Lord has commanded. Verse 10, so you got to, giving God first your time, your talents, your treasures right here. It is estimated, I don't know who did this, but okay, it was in the Bible scholar stuff, that about a ton of gold went into the construction of the tabernacle. I don't know how they carried that thing. Three tons of silver. I, we don't even know how much wood was done, but multiple tons, as well as m- multiple miles of various threads and cloth. This was a mammoth task requiring a lot of material and valuable material at that. This was the Lord's house. This was the presence where the God would dwell. So this dwelling place of God was to be constructed. God's presence would be experienced among them. The people would need to participate materially and even sacrificially. But as you look through these two chapters, look how many times the word voluntary, freely, willingly are used. So all through the rest of the verses, 11 through 19 in chapter 35, Moses lists all these things. And then Moses does such a boneheaded thing. He's got the people right where he's got them. I mean, He's ready for the big ass, the pitch. And he goes, all right, see y'all. Peace out. Go home. He sends them home without passing the offering plate. Man, dude, you missed the golden moment. Look at verse 20. Then all the congregation of the people of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Why, why would Moses not leverage that moment? Moses gave the big pitch, he gave the details, and then he just, man, he was on a one-yard line. There was no defensive line, and he could have just walked in his score, but he said, no, not going to do it. This is a pretty big emotional moment for the Israelites. And if they, if they return home, they may rethink what they were feeling at that moment. You know, Pastor Kay shared with me a capital campaign at church is not about fundraising, it's about faith raising. You know, y'all been to those galas. I was, I was in one last couple weeks ago. In fact, I want to say thank you and, 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 and leaders from Colorado Springs. I, I serve on the Children's Hope Chess Board of Directors, and I was there for a Board of Directors meeting. Then they had a global partners conference where they asked me to speak, and then we had a 30th anniversary gala. And, and, and then the next day I went and traveled to Austin where we had two of our staff were uh, leading presentations. I met with a lot, of, a lot of pastors and really helping inform the direction of our district. Um, we had one, Pastor Steve, presented an Outstanding Educator of the Year Award. And I just love to see how Gloria Day is using their gifts, talents, and abilities outside of Gloria Day. And I can tell you, over and over with Children's Hope Chest, I kept hearing about Gloria Day and this Ocheloy Care Point, the flagship community. And that's because of your generosity, because of what God is doing in and through you. In fact, I'm going back there at the end of January and February to meet the government officials and do a ribbon-cutting ceremony on a new skill center that we've built that the entire country of Uganda wants to use as a central training facility. I mean, praise God for that, y'all. That's just amazing. But think about those galas you've been to. You know the drill. You get all dressed up. You go to this event. 
Nice food is served, and there's a slideshow presentation. There's usually entertainment. You got the whole thing going on. And, you know, as, as coffee and dessert are being served, you notice that little envelope under the plate underneath the coffee. And you, you, uh, you pull that thing out, and, 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 you know, it's the commitment card and the pledge card. And, and, and a good fundraiser will tell you, you don't ever let anybody leave the room until they turn in a card. In fact, some galas, they're so nice they often put guards at the entrance, at the exits. You know, like the volunteers, and they hold a basket and, or some kind of like, oh, we're here to serve you. And we just, we don't want you to work too hard to put your card in, what you feel like, you know what, they're just watching to see if I turn a card in. Can I sneak out the back? Do I have to, what do I do? Do I put a blank envelope in? How do I do this? Oh. If a capital campaign is done like that, I don't want nothing part of it. I'm not saying what they do is wrong. I understand the concept. I am blessed to serve in a church where I have multiple times with y'all. Because this is about raising people. Helping people understand the grace of giving. And maybe for the first time in life, taking a first step and trusting God with their finances. Trusting in God's grace and his provision. Because this entire process has been bathed in prayer and deliberation. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Each one must give as he or she has decided in her heart, his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. It's a model that Moses used. God distinctly said he wanted the gifts to come from those who were, quote, unquote, hearts were stirred to give. That God was moving in their hearts and their lives to respond to his grace and mercy in their lives. That they would take time to pray, to discuss with their family, to think through of all of God's abundance. Remember how God has taken care of them from Egyptian captivity to deliverance from the Red Sea to man and quail in the wilderness but how they had disobeyed God in 40 days, how God relented, how he forgave them, how he brought them back into a relationship with them and said, my presence will dwell among you in a tabernacle. And maybe, maybe God's people went home and they were marveling, like Alex shared with us last week, about the sense of awe, how God would use the Israelites for his glory among all the nations that they would conquer. And look what happened after sending the people home. Verse 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him, everyone whose spirit moved him, and brought the Lord's contribution to be used in the tent of meeting and for all the service and for all the holy garments. This is the model we're following. Y'all, for the past, I don't even know how long it's been, the last past three weeks, I've been in so many home group gatherings. I've, I've made multiple awareness forums. I've been sharing the plan and intent of this campaign at breakfast, at lunch, at coffee, wherever people listen to it. I've used every opportunity afforded to me to share what I believe God is leading this congregation for the next 25 to 50 years. We've been walking through a sermon series about God doing immeasurably more in the hearts and the lives of God's people. I've been praying that he would open up hearts and lives to know his grace and love for them. We'd offer weekly Bible studies, daily devotionals, other resources for folks to understand and how to excel in the grace of giving. We sent out newsletters, built a webpage, created video content for you next week. After much prayer and discussion with your family, I pray you'll respond and God will show up in a measure more ways than we could ever ask or imagine. Now, just like in times of Moses, if you actually look at, in the Old Testament times, the people were still contributing to the daily needs. In fact, 23.3% was required of them through their tithe, their festivals, and the offerings. And God says, I want you to give even more. What we're doing today as you leave, you're going to receive two cards. And they got two different colors on top. And the first card I want to talk to you about is our 2025 annual commitment pledge. Every October we do this. We look about what God is calling us to do as a family within your own home. 
how God is calling you to commit to the mission and ministry of Gloria Day. And on the back, it gives you different steps. And what I love this is on the first step, if you're not giving right now, can I tell you something? Please don't give to the capital campaign. Give to the regular fund. Give to the mission and ministry of Gloria Day. That's the stuff that helps with the day in and day out operations. That's the stuff that's helping us help more people live life with Jesus every day. And it says become a first time giver or, or move into a giving on a regular basis or growing toward a tithe. Maybe every year, increase your percentage. I got a guy in my last church. This guy was a millionaire next door, had no idea. He lived such a humble life. He was so filled with joy and generosity. Lord's called him home, but the last capital campaign we did, Pastor Kay was actually doing it with me. And he shared on that night. He shared his goal was to live on 20% and give away 80%. And because of the capital campaign we were doing, he's able to finally accomplish that goal. Like, that's extravagant, y'all. In Exodus 35, everybody's heart was stirred. And the Spirit moved them to make this contribution. Men and William, women with willing hearts. Regardless of the amount. Uh, guys, I want you all to hear, this isn't for somebody else. This is for how God is calling you individually as part of this congregation. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how, what kind of income you have, if it's fixed or it's fluctuating. What is God calling you to do? What is my response to God's grace and blessing for 2025? And then next Sunday, we're going to bring back these immeasurably more commitment cards, and I want you to take these home. Because I'll finish up with this. I want to finish up with Exodus chapter 36. You know the two guys that were skilled and craftsmen? I'm going to make up their names. Bezalel and Oliab. You say it real boldly, and everybody thinks you know the words. Verse 2, Moses called Bezalel and Oliab and every craftsman whose mind the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. Listen to this. And they still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came, each from the task that he was doing, and said to Moses, Moses, make them stop. The people bringing too much, more than is enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, stop the offering. Y'all, in 28 years, I have never said that. The word was proclaimed throughout the camp, let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. The people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. If that's not showing up in a measure more ways, I don't know what is. I'm praying God's gonna show up in a measure more ways. Now, have I been praying that I gotta tell y'all to quit giving? I haven't done that yet. I think I'm gonna start praying that. And I want you to look on the back of this card. There's a gift level guide. On the back of this card, I want you to take this home. If you're married, do it privately and then talk to your spouse and see if you guys line up. And then as you guys bring alignment, pray about it. Is this a sacrificial gift? Is this a gift that I want to give to my Lord in response to his grace and blessing above and beyond my regular giving? I want to tell you guys, your leaders, the board of directors, the staff, they've already gone through this exercise. In fact, last week we had a special event, it was called our initial commitments. And as an act of leadership and commitment modeling, First Chronicles 29, check this out, y'all. Your leaders have already committed $2.2 million to this campaign. How are the rest of us gonna respond? How are we gonna respond with God's grace and blessing as we look forward to kids and the families and the students of Gloria Day, praying that he'll show up in immeasurably more ways to the mission and ministry of Gloria Day as we do some upgrades, some repairs, some expansion, but do an intentional focus for the next 25 to 50 years 
for our kids. I invite you to join me in that journey. I invite you to see if God's going to show up in a measure more ways than we can ask or imagine. And I pray you will struggle. And I pray you will pray and ask God to lead you to a place where you place your faith, your hope, your trust in him and respond joyfully, gratefully, generously. May God grant that to each of us for Jesus' sake. To him alone be the glory. Amen, let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for the model you've given us with Moses and the Israelites building your tabernacle. I thank you, Lord, that there's never a great time to start a capital campaign, but in the midst of all that, Lord, you showed up and you showed off. I pray, Lord, you'll use the people of Gloria Day in a measure more ways to navigate through this capital campaign. That people would come back and say, wow, that was amazing. But most of all, Lord, I pray that you would grow folks to help them grow in their faith, their hope, their trust of you and their finances with their resources, with their stuff. That we might stop worshiping the idols in our lives and see you as number one priority in our lives and that you give, we are your stewards of all the things you give us, that all we have is yours anyway and that it's our opportunity to live as a trust of you. So Lord, bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we continue to receive our Lord's blessings and the gifts that he gives to us, we prepare our hearts to receive his meal in bread and wine in his son's body and blood. Uh, if you have mobility issues, we would invite you to let an usher know. We'd be honored to bring communion to you. And we would also invite you to accept the invitation of the usher as they guide you to your communion station. Would you join with me as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then to will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in praying the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite all the communion assistants forward to prepare the elements at their stations and to come up front to receive Holy Communion. And while they do that, we want to prepare our hearts and go to our Lord and confess our sins to him and the areas in our life where we lack trust in his provision, where there's times that we hold on and we control and we are really worried and scared about giving away and being generous. Someone once told me, I have never met a joyful tightwad, and that is so true. And this is not about money, this is about generosity and joy in our hearts, this is about contentment. And so this moment is a moment to go before our Lord and ask him to increase our faith to help us see ways that we can be even more generous in our lives, whether it's with our money, our time, or with the people that he's given to us. They wouldn't be able to pour into them and leave a legacy in their lives. So we carve out this moment and we, whatever posture you need to be to fold your hands, close your eyes, whatever that may look like, to go before your Lord and confess your brokenness to him and receive his strength and grace and forgiveness. Our Lord hears our confession and he is so faithful and generous to forgive us of all of our sins and give us a new life to live every day. So trust in this promise that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. Amen. 
Our Lord shows us his generosity in this meal, giving us his body and his blood. So we hear the words that our Lord Jesus spoke in the night in which he was betrayed when he took bread and broke it and gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said, take and drink of it all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The gifts of our Lord's body and blood are for you that your faith might be strengthened in him. Welcome to our Lord's table.
In this meal, we have experienced the goodness of God, and he promises his grace and his mercy every single moment of our lives. So go then, forgiven and freed, and trusting in that promise that you are loved in Jesus Christ because of the sacrifice that he made for you. And as we extend this worship out into our community, uh, a number, uh, an announcement, just an event to, coming up to let you know about. There is a dinner coming up with a special guest uh, to remind, especially women, uh, your calling in life and, and the image of God uh, that you've been created in. Uh, there'll be a meal, a special guest, uh, a speaker, uh, as well as um, a worship, a time of worship and music. So that event is on November 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the Life Center. Scan the QR code, be sure to register, and tell other people about that to attend this event. And we've been talking about immeasurably more and about the impact uh, that Glory Day has, not just from this event, but with our capital campaign especially. So there's one family in our church that we want to highlight the impact of all of our influence in their lives and what a difference worship and children ministries has made in their family. We are the Onicheks. Uh, I'm Chase, this is Kyla, Fisher, and Malin. We've been attending Glory Day for about five years now. Yeah, we've, we've loved it. Um, when we first started attending, the kids were much smaller, so we would put them in the um, children's nursery. But um, the, the longer that we've attended, we've, we've definitely felt more comfortable um, and, and also encouraged from the pastors and, and congregation to bring the kids into the worship center with us. And so we've definitely been trying to do so. Um, our typical Sunday looks like 9.45 um, Bible study um, where we drop off the, the kids at the, um, the, the kids center. And then uh, we pick them up at 11 for um, the 11 o'clock service. So one particular Sunday, however, Chase was unable to attend. So rather than having both squirmy kids in the uh, worship center with me by myself, I went ahead and, and took them to um, um, the, the daycare. So after church was over, I went to, to pick them up and um, I said, all right, let's go home. It's time to leave. And she just started crying. She's like, oh, Mom, we didn't go to church, though. I want to go to church. And I just felt so bad. Um, you know, I told her, we'll be back next week. And, and um, you know, and, and I just, it made me think as a, as a parent, you know, just how thankful we are to be attending a church where they, you know, feel comfortable um, and, you know, it feels reassuring that the, the worship center is where they prefer to be. Yeah, it's just great to be at a place where we know that Gloria Day invests in the children as much as they do in the rest of the congregation and looking forward to see what the capital campaign can do with the, the new facilities and to bring, you know, the families together and parents together um, so we can all share our stories and our, and, you know, connect with each other um, and just enjoy our community that we have at the church. Uh, I love that story. Uh, I was actually there with Pastor Randy as a home group gathering. They shared that and Pastor Randy said, we have to put that on video. Because that, guys, that, that encapsulates really why we're here and what we do. You know, I don't know if I've shared this with y'all. I know I haven't, but I'm gonna do it anyway. It's a dream of mine is that I could figure out this faith family that we've got folks who've got like grandkid withdrawal. And then we have oftentimes single moms or we have parents with small children and they're doing everything they can just to navigate through the worship service because they, they, they need 17 hands, but they've got two. Would it be cool? Would it be so awesome if we could figure out a way, not in a weird way, but a relational way that that grandparent figures out how to build a relationship with that parent and that parent doesn't wig out that, now you think I'm a bad parent. No, no, no. That they want to give you time to worship. And that we bring two generations together that form a faith family. That to me is a church, y'all. Huge, huge value of mine. Kids will be in worship. I want kids to understand and learn and grow what it means to worship. So we send them off to college, wherever they go. That's not the first time they've been in the worship service. 
And so, yeah, it gets noisy at times in here, and I love it. But I love the opportunity we have together as four generations of this congregation to worship together, to live together, to serve together, to, to do life together. And so I invite you to join with me in the Measure More Capital campaign. Next week, we're going to bring those cards forward. Bring that one home with you. Pray about it. If you forget it, we'll have some here again next week. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring those forward as an act of worship to the altar. There will be no guards here at the usher. There'll be no uh, ushers right there. They give me a hard time when I said that this morning. Because this is about grace giving. This is about responding cheerfully, voluntarily, freely about what God is doing in your life. And I invite every one of you to be a part of it. It doesn't matter the size of the gift. We always say not equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. And then after that service, by the way, it's at 10 o'clock. If you show up at 11, you're going to be late. Okay? Uh, be here at 10, and it's going to be a great service. And then afterward, we're going to have an Oktoberfest. Yes, we're going to have Lutheran lemonade. Um, and we're going to have brats, and we're going to have all kinds of stuff. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. There's, well, I'm not going to give a spoiler alert. You just got to come. There's, there, you want me a spoiler alert? You want me spoiler? Okay, I got permission. I don't understand how this works at Oktoberfest, but it's going to be awesome. We have a comfort dog. Well, next Sunday, we're going to have comfort alpacas in Lederhosen. I mean... I mean, a dream of Stephanie's to have alpacas here. I don't know what that all means, but they're going to be here. So bring your kids and cameras and everything else. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun. And I pray you'll join us in this journey. With that, I invite the congregation to please stand. Hey, guys, we're getting ready to go out in, into the mission field. And we have the opportunity to be full of it. Okay? Live like you're full of it. Full of God's grace, his love, his mercy. His forgiveness. Find somebody who needs to be filled with the fullness of God and give it to them. That people might see Jesus in you. That you might be that light on a hill. That you might be the salt of the earth. That you might be the reason people are going to help more. We're going to help more people live life with Jesus every day. That God will show up in immeasurably more ways through you. So as you go out in the spaces where you live, where you work, where you learn, you gather, you play, go in his name and with his blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, look upon his face, shine upon you. The Lord, give you his countenance and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Let's close it out. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. Last week.